tricky payroll situation. My name is Julie Dorr, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Our presentation will last approximately 40 minutes, and with the remaining time, we'll hold that for your questions. Earlier this morning, I sent you a handout that came in the form of an email from Linda, and it included a PDF that's easy for you to download. If you haven't received that, go ahead and email me at julie at the door group, and I'll send that to you right away. Also, if you do have questions during the presentation, feel free to use that question section over on the right-hand side. And you can just type your question in the bottom, and at the very end of the presentation, we'll answer your questions, and I should say ask some of our presenters, and then answer them um, at the end. Before we get started, please note that this webinar and all the accompanying materials are protected by copyright, and that the entire conference is being recorded. This presentation provides general information only and does not constitute legal advice. We recommend that you consult with legal counsel to address your specific situation. So let's get started today by welcoming our expert panel, Linda and Marla. First, we have Linda Duffy, who's the president of Ethos Human Capital Solutions. Linda works with business owners and executives to provide strategic human resources direction, develop leadership talent, and also work with teams and increase organizational effectiveness. We also have attorney Marla Mara Robinson. Marla's with the law firm Mara Robinson Jackson and Clarkson, where she is a partner and head of the firm's transactional department. She primarily practices in the area of corporate, mergers and acquisition, real estate, finance, and of course, employment law. Marla's gonna start us off today, so Marla, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Julie, and welcome everyone. I'm just getting over a cold and some laryngitis, so I'm hoping I can make it through. Linda's promised to pick up if I, if I don't, but you'll have to excuse my raspy voice. So the title today is Tricky Payroll Situations, and here's our agenda. I would call it a little bit different. I think this is a, a, a snapshot of many webinars we've done before that can be found on YouTube, and I'll, I'll point them out as we go along. Um, but the, there are areas of law that just result in, in payroll situations because the, the law has been incorrectly followed. I want to remind everybody, however, that it, we are not talking about collective bargaining agreements or union shops. Uh, but each of those would need to be looked at individually because when you're dealing with union, you need to look at the specific collective bargaining agreement between the union and the employer for all employment matters. So with that, let's move on to our first tricky situation and that's meal period violations. Again, this is uh, we did a very lengthy webinar on this right after the Brinker case came out. Um, it just as a reminder that non-exempt employees must clock in and out for meal periods. I hope everybody knows that. <laughs> and, it, and if you don't, there's a one-hour meal period penalty. The Brinker case gave some clarification on, on, on some language in the wage order as to when the uh, meal period must start. And the court said that the employees must start the meal period before the beginning of their fifth work hour. So, for example, if an employee works from 8 to 5, the meal period must start before 1 p.m. Our, our, and again, our previous webinar can be found on your YouTube channel. The next tricky situation is not requiring employees to track time. This is one of the most common that we see all the time. First, the type of tracking. The law, federal and state law, do not prescribe the method to be used to track time. It does not have to be a time clock, and that's a, a very common mistake employers think that it does. And with technology, we've got lots of new types of ways to track time. There's fingerprints, there's computers, there's, you know, login from phones, and the old-fashioned paper timesheets are also okay. The important thing is to track time. With exempt employees, you do, are not required to, to track time at all. However, if there is any question, and when we get into the definition of exempt versus non-exempt, we'll see there's a lot of gray areas. If there is any question at all that this employee may not be exempt, please have them track their time. And the reason for that is if the employee files a claim and the determination is made that they were misclassified as exempt, Whatever hours they present to the Division of Labor Standards and Enforcement, or the DLSE, will be deemed absolutely true. It's very difficult for the employer to refute at that time. We have been able to refute some by showing computer time in and out, or 
more importantly, if you have security cameras, we've, we've shown that the employee wasn't even, wasn't even at work that day, that they're deemed true and then the employer has to uh, oppose them and it's very difficult uh, to do that if you don't have the time records. If you have the records and then you take the, the DLSE's opinion that it, the employee is exempt and you have the records to do the proper calculation. Every time I've seen an employee who was improperly classified go in and make a claim to the DLSE for overtime, they give them a, uh, a sheet to fill out for the hours worked and they, out, they just put in whatever they want. And many times we will see that they work from seven to seven every day, seven to seven, seven to seven, <laughs> for three years. So that the risks of not tracking are, are um, you know, violation of the laws and then not being able to dispute what the actual time records were. Now remember rest periods you're not required to clock out. Our next tricky situation is unauthorized deductions and this is another very common mistake. You generally you cannot make deductions from an employee's paycheck unless it's required by law or expressly authorized in writing by the employee. And the most common are insurance, hospital, or medical dues, taxes I would add to that if you're taking notes, right, in taxes. Those are, are, are deductions that are, are authorized. But again, some of them by law, some of them by the employee in writing. The most common is um, failure to obtain permission from an employee to deduct for return of tools or uniforms or any equipment, phones, keys, credit card, sometimes there's a cost to replace a credit card, and the employer will deduct that from the employee's paycheck. You cannot do that unless you have previously received in writing what we call a receipt of company property form. It doesn't really matter what you title it, but it's permission from the employee to deduct from their final paycheck should they not turn the equipment back in. And you must put the amount in there so that the employee has advanced notice. Now, if that's going to make it so that the employee doesn't receive minimum wage, then you need to make sure that the minimum wage is that is paid. You can sue the employee in small claims if you want, or if it's a, you know, a larger sum, then, then you can do that. The other most common mistake here is for debt. Some of you may be familiar with the Barnhill decision, which was the first court decision to give employers direction on deductions for debt. In order, if you make a loan to or an advance to an employee in order to deduct the monthly payments for that debt or any amount for that debt, you need to have in writing permission from the employee. If the employee gets terminated, even if your permission says you can take all of it at the at termination, you need it again at termination. It doesn't count during the time the debt is going on. So if you have an employee who borrows, you know, $100 or uh, $1,200 and they're going to pay back $100 a month and they get terminated in the middle of the year and they haven't paid it all back. In order to deduct it from their final paycheck, you need to get it in writing from them again. And again, the company property one is the one we, you need to have that and that's so common because of the cell phones and laptops and types of things. And with exempt employee deductions, um, you know, the, the weekly salary can be prorated if and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I'm going to deal with this later. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Misclassifying employees as independent contractors. So we have, again, done a, another whole webinar on this and encourage you to go to our YouTube and, and look at this. It's defined by law, not the party's agreement. I have employers come to me all the time and say, well, the, the employee asked to be an independent contractor. It doesn't matter. The employee doesn't have the right to ask. The law determines. And, it, and in the case of the, um, the federal and state government, it's going to be either the IRS or the EDD generally that are going to determine. Sometimes it goes into the state court, sometimes it goes to the DLSD, but more, most commonly it's IRS and the EDD. And it comes up when the worker has been terminated and is, is disgruntled and says, wait a minute, I should have been an employee instead of an independent contractor. Sometimes it comes up in class actions, which is very frightening. The penalties here are huge. Just examples of back wages, payroll taxes, interest, civil penalties of between 5,000 and 25,000 per violation. There are federal penalties on the IRS side. There are different separate penalties on the EDD side. So if, if this is an issue, you need to discuss it with a lawyer or a consultant like Linda so you can know what each of those are. There is also, everybody should write this down, potential personal liability to the IRS and the 
EDB. This is a huge exposure here for the person who is in charge of paying the employee. So if they don't pay their taxes, the employer could be responsible. And if the employer doesn't, then the individual could be responsible. It's very, very frightening. Um, employers also often make the mistake of providing benefits to their independent contractors uh, that are only for employees, such as health insurance or um, vacation days. They also sometimes have them sign employment documents or give them uh, the, the employee handbook. Um, a couple of years ago, California adopted a new law that requires if the employer has been found to have misclassified a worker or worse workers, um, I, I, call, I call this the parent um, penalty, the employer must display a notice in an area that's accessible to all employees and the general public, and if there is a website, also on the website. And it must rate, remain up there for one year. It must be signed by a corporate officer. How embarrassing is this? And it must state the following. The employer has committed a serious violation of the law by engaging in the willful misclassification of employees. The employer has changed its business practices to avoid committing for their violations of the law. Any employee who believes that he or she is being misclassified as an independent contractor may contract, contact the Labor and Workforce Development Agency and, and the notice must post the agency. This notice is being posted pursuant to a state order. Very embarrassing. Next tricky payroll situation, or excuse me, same situation um, when we're dealing with independent contractors, the 20 common law tests. The, there's no one test that controls whether someone is an independent contractor or an employee. There is a general rule on both the state side and the federal side that whoever controls the means and method of the work being performed, not the outcome, but the means and method of the work being performed, is determines whether the, it, the person is an, a worker, independent contractor, or an employee. These 20 common law tests help us make that determination of the general rule. Now, it is very often when we're analyzing this for our clients and employers that we can't tell for sure. We could say, you have a good argument that this worker is an independent contractor, but we can't tell you, we cannot say for sure. Um, and, and then that's when you have that risk that I talked about earlier on, on timekeeping, where you really want to make sure that person is keeping track of their records or their time um, and, and tracking their time. So that happens very often. There are other times when we can clearly give the opinion, absolutely, this person um, can be an independent contractor. Um, or this entity, if you're dealing with a corporation owner, an LLC, that can help the determination tremendously because it goes to the investment, capital investment by the worker um, and the fact that they're working for others. So these tests are not, again, what, not, not one of them controls. You have to look at all of them. Here's, I gave some examples here just of the difference between an independent contractor. This first example is you know, dance instructors who select their own dance routines. They locate and rent their own facilities, so there's their capital investment. They provide their own sound system, more capital investment, music and clothing. And then they collect the fees themselves, and they're free to hire assistants, they're free to hire um, people to help them with the routines all, all on their own. That would be an example of an independent contractor where the employee example would be an instructor who works in a health club. And the health club says, you will work from 8 to 5. Here's the routines we want, it, want you to teach, or here's the type of classes, more likely. And then we'll pay you a fee for um, uh, each of those classes from what we collect from the customers. And so we determine what the fee is. That's an example of an employee. You can see who's controlling the means and methods of the work. They're both the same outcome. They both have the same outcome of type of work they're doing, but it's the means and methods. Here's another example. The repair person who owns or rents, there's their capital investment, a shop, advertises their services to the public, which means they're working for more than one entity or person, furnishes all their own tools and equipment and supplies, again, more capital, and then sets their own prices, they make the determination, and then collects on their own. That would be an example of an independent contractor. The employee example would be a, per, a repair person who's working in a shop, or the owner of the shop is the one who sets the prices, sets the hours and tells the employee this is when you will work. Here's when the shop hours are open, and you, here's how you're going to be paid, more often than not paid by the hour, or a percentage of work that's done. That would be an example of an employee. 
Okay, misclassifying as exempt. Like independent contractor versus employee, exempt versus non-exempt is a very tricky analysis and I encourage everyone to get help from either a consultant like Linda or an attorney. It, it, the the uh, penalties for misclassifying are huge. Again, there's no personal liability here, fortunately. Um, we also have a, a very lengthy webinar you can look at on YouTube for this um, situation, so I'm just going to touch on it briefly. Um, they often, employers' biggest mistake is they say, I'm going to pay this person a salary, so they're going to be exempt. That's not the test. They must fall into one of the FLSA categories, and I want everyone, again, to take note, and the California wage orders. Please write that down. That's a mistake on our slides that I missed, because they, they have to fall under both exemptions. The, they're very similar, but the ex exemptions are generally executive, administrative, professional, outside sales, and computer professional. And we'll go through, Linda's going to go through some of those um, for you, but just in quick sum, um, the executive is someone that is managing 51% um, or more of the time and has authority to hire, fire, promote, demote. Are they administrative as somebody who's making business decisions, not working on the business, but working about the business? Uh, that's the hardest one, and we're looking for some more um, direction from our courts on that. Professional is the easiest one. If you're a teacher, a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, if you have uh, those licenses, um, a dentist, then you fall in the professional exemption. Outside sales is somebody who's outside selling 51% or more of the time. And then the computer professional, I would direct you to the wage orders because there's a long, long definition of what they, type of work they have to be doing. All of them must meet the salary requirement of at least two times minimum wage, um, which is currently, I think, 37, 440, and will be 41, 6 next January. Um, and they all must use independent discretion and judgment. And this is where we see the most difficult um, question about who is exempt and non-exempt. Some examples on the next slide. Employees paid for all our work. On the non-exempt side, it's employees who are paid for all hours worked. They're paid overtime for all hours worked over eight and all hours over 40. They must be permitted to take those meal breaks we talked about earlier and rest breaks. And they must record their time. Um, exempt, as we discussed, um, they, they don't have to record their time, but they can. They, they get paid to get the job done regardless of the hours worked. So they can work three hours a week and they're still going to get the same pay. They can work 50 hours a week and they're still going to get the same pay. But it's a set salary generally. Sometimes there's bonuses and um, profit sharing on top of that. They are not paid for overtime and they're not required to take meal or rest breaks. So here are some common questions uh, employers ask when they're trying to determine whether someone is exempt or non-exempt that Linda and I hear all the time. The work my employee does is really important. Is the employee exempt? The value of the work has no bearing on the legal definitions for the exempt classification. They are in a nutshell, just as I, I gave you. And one of the best examples I can give you is I, I had a client who had an accountant. And he said, I want this accountant to be exempt. Well, we went through all the tests. The accountant did not use in any independent judgment at all. We just did accounting. They were not allowed to say, let's increase our line of credit. Let's, let's pay our line of credit. Let's pay this person more. There was no independent judgment at all. They took direction from the CEO on every single thing the accountant did. Next question. This employee makes important decisions. Is he or she exempt? Again, this is just one of the elements. The one I just gave the example of, of the accountant. It's, it's, it's not how important the decisions are by itself. It needs to have certain types of decisions also. So you may have someone who's a manager, but if they don't have the authority to hire, fire, promote, demote, discipline, or at least participate in those decisions where their, their knowledge and their opinion matter, then you're not going to have exempt even though they make other important decisions. The other elements must always be there. I want to reward an employee by making him or her exempt. Can I do that? No. Again, this is the very common mistake of I'll give them a salary that will make them exempt. You've got to have all of those other elements there. An agreement to be exempt does not override the law. What if an employee is doing both non-exempt and exempt work? 
if at least 51% of the time in the week is actually performing the exempt work, that will be okay. And the best case on this is from our own local Taco Bell. This was several years ago, but they, they were hit, I think it was a $35 million judgment because they were treating what they called their key managers um, as exempt because they did hire and fire and promote to note. The problem was they weren't doing it 51% or more of the time because they also sold tacos. 51% or more of the time is where they did that work, and the management work was less. So you have to look at that very carefully. Uh, what duties are they performing? Are, are those duties the, the um, exempt duties? However, you can combine or what we call TAC, tacky. The regulations permit the taxing of exempt work, and that's where the combination applies and there's more than one type of work the person's doing. Uh, very common, we'll see this, where there's, there's administrative work being done, the person's making business decisions about business policies, but they're also doing management work. So you can combine those two. The salary requirements still apply. Again, employees cannot waive the right to overtime. I think a funny payroll, tricky payroll situation is the following slide that training wages are hourly. Employers will often hire an exempt employee and the most common would be outside salespeople or certain commission salespeople uh, that make more than 51% of their wages in commission. And they have them do work that's not tied to their commission pay. For example, training. Um, I'm aware of a, a gal who was hired to work for a well-known payroll company and had to go through three weeks of training out of state and should have been paid hourly for that training and was not. So this is, a, to me, a, a tricky situation because most employers don't know about it. So this is kind of jumping back to the exempt, not non-exempt analysis. These are the types of exempt pay deductions that are permissible. During the employee's first and last week of employment, you can, um, prorate the week where it begins and ends in the middle of the work week, and, and that's, all, that's allowed. When the employee is absent for one or more full days for personal reasons other than sickness or disability. So we had conflicting decisions in the courts on this until 2004, and, and then the court said it's okay to deduct for one full day after exhaustion of vacation or other PTO. It's not allowed if, if based on lack of work which I've, I've never heard of happening, but it could. Um, however, it has to be based on the party's understanding of what the normal work uh, schedule is. And it has to only uh, be one full day. I do not uh, um, recommend to my clients that they do this. I think it's too risky, but especially if they're not timekeeping for their exempt employees. The, the general rule is that the exempt employee works one day of the week and you have to determine what that work week is, five, six, or seven days. So they work one day, and you have to define it, excuse me, if it's Saturday to, to uh, Sunday or Sunday to Saturday, uh, you have to define what that work week is. There's so many places to make a mistake, and if you make a mistake once, you can convert that employee to a non-exempt, and then they're entitled to overtime. And with cell phones and laptops and the ability to get check in just about anywhere and do any work, uh, it, most um, exempt employees are, are doing work at least for one day of that week. So my recommendation is don't don't deduct. Um, the reason exempt employees are exempt is because they're generally paid more, and you expect more um, from them. So they work many many hours. The, state, the, the courts like to see the reverse be true, where they're not working. It's okay because they've put in the hours uh, maybe on the other week or the other side or the other month. Uh, and this is the same thing here making on the exempt pay for partial day absences. You can deduct from their accrued leave benefits for the partial day absences, but not reduce their pay. So it just adds on to it. So tricky, I just don't recommend it. Exempt pay deductions that are impermissible for quality, or quant I should say quantity and quality, not quality and quality, for unavailability of work, for disciplinary reasons, for jury duty, witness duty, and military duty unless absent for a full work, work week. And that, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Linda. 
Well, thanks, Marla. That was great as always, and I'm sure everybody got a lot out of it. And thanks for powering through. I could hear your voice get a little weak toward the end, so I appreciate you uh, fighting through that. Hi, everybody. And again, as Marla said, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to continue where Marla left off and talk about a couple of things that tag, tag along with the exempt, non-exempt. So one of the things that comes up a lot for me with my clients is they have inside salespeople. Um, they also have outside salespeople. And the outside salespeople, you can pretty much, I don't want to say do anything you want to with them, but pretty much that. Um, so if they're outside and that means being away from the office or a home office or anything more than 50% of the time, it could be 100% commission. They can do whatever you want to do with them. But inside salespeople have to be traded differently. and there are two um, IWC orders that allow employees to be exempt, but there are two uh, criteria that you have to meet in order for that to be the case. The first one is that their earnings have to be at least one and a half times the minimum wage, and that more than half of their total comp comes from commissions. So 51% or more, or 50, I guess, yeah, more than 50% have to come from commissions. So a lot of times what happens is you say, well, we're going to pay them 10 bucks an hour, and then they're going to get commission on top of that. And that's fine as for on the second part of this, as long as when they make commission for that month, you look at it and you say, oh, yeah, it was more, you know, that was more than half of their comp was in the form of commission. Well, what happened last year was this Peabody, uh, versus Time Warner cable decision came out, and it made it a little bit more difficult for everybody to meet uh, the first bullet point on the one and a half times minimum wage. Because what Peabody basically said is this, is wh how we used to do it is we would take a look, and let's say you work the month of May that we're in right now, and then you're going to pay commission in the month of June, right? So you work the month, you calculate the commission, and then that shows up we'll say on the, on the first check in the month of June. Maybe you're paying people bi-weekly or semi-monthly or something like that. Well, it used to be that what we did is look at that commission and we'd go back to the month of May and we would attribute it to the month of May and we'd say, okay, well, how much did they actually make in commission relative to how much they made during the month? We'd look at that. We'd also look at it and we'd say, okay, how much did they um, make in commission? And if we spread that out over the hours that they worked during the month of May, May, did we meet the one and a half times minimum wage, which would right now be thirteen fifty an hour? The problem is when Peabody came out, they basically said can't do it that way. You only can look at the commission when it's paid. So meaning, if you're paying commission one times a month, you can only apply it in that pay period when you're paying it. So now, how do you make up the other? How do you meet that burden for the other pay periods during the month? If you're paying somebody ten bucks an hour, it doesn't work. There's no way to get them to 1350. So this was not an employer-friendly decision. So we just want to point it out to everybody to make sure that you understand that, because um, that came out um, like I think it was like July or September of last year, and a lot of people have not caught up their policies with this. Also remember that whenever you have a commission or bonus structure or this tied to productivity, it has to be put in writing in California. A lot of my clients don't remember to do that as well. So you want to make sure that uh, all of these things are met as you're going through and looking at those, uh, those um, items. Okay, so let's talk about one thing that comes up also, which is if you are going to, maybe you're going to pay it multiple times during the month, maybe you're going to somehow do it a different way, but if you have to go back and take a look and figure out, okay, I have to pay this person overtime because they did not make more than half of their uh, compensation in the form of commission, then he, Sorry for the math, but here's how you would take a look at it. Um, this is the same same way we're going to do this in a second slide for a different reason. So let's say this person is an inside sales rep making 10 bucks an hour. They keep track of their time because we don't know whether they're going to be non-exempt or exempt for the month, and they work 44 hours, right? So 40 regular hours and four overtime hours. So their base comp for the job would be 440. Then let's say they got paid $150 in commission. So you take a look at that. You take the total compensation they made divided by the total hours worked, and then you have a new regular rate. That's one of the other things I see a lot is there confusion between a base rate and regular rate. Regular rate is just what I said. It's taking all of the money you made during that, let's say, week or whatever it is, um, divided by the amount, um, the number of hours worked, and that gets you a regular rate. That is what is used to calculate the overtime. Now, if you've paid the person 10 bucks an hour and you've already paid them, 
you know, 10 bucks an hour for all of that. What you're going to look at is just what do I owe them for the overtime premium. And in this case, you're going to take half of that. So we take the 590, we divide by the total hours, and that gets us a regular rate of 1341 compared to the base rate of 10. And then half of that becomes that overtime premium amount of 670. So now you go back and you say, okay, we're going to pay the person 670 times four hours of the overtime, and that's the amount. So now the total gross wages paid isn't just the 590 that we had earlier, but once you add in the overtime, you tack on that 2682 in premium, and that's how it it's going to show up is that 6, 1682. So I'm hoping by spelling it out, you don't have any questions about that, but if you do, shoot me an email later or give me a specific example and I'll help you do that calculation. Now similarly, and this happens actually in my company, I have an outside consultant. Um, I pay her one rate of pay for consulting time and another rate of pay for drive time. So I have to do this calculation all the time, or rather my payroll company does. Um, and this is something I actually use as a test when vetting payroll companies, to be honest with you, because I used to have one that couldn't do this calculation. So I have somebody, let's say she gets 10 bucks an hour when she's doing, or let's say driving, and you know $15 an hour when she's doing consulting. Or you might have somebody that has two different jobs inside your company. You're allowed to pay them different rates of pay if they're doing different jobs. So again, you're going to take the total hours by that base rate, whatever it is, total that up, look at the total number of hours worked, in this example 45, and it's the same type of calculation. What's the total amount of dollars that were earned during that time period divided by the number of hours worked? Now, I had to actually argue with my old payroll, former payroll company, emphasis on former because of this, because they said, oh no, what you would do is you would pay overtime based on what the person was doing when they worked the extra hours. That is not correct. So like in the example with um, Miriam, who works for me, she would drive an hour to get to a client, she'd be there eight hours, let's say, and then drive home for another hour. And I said, really? So if she had two hours of overtime that day, you're telling me I would pay one hour of her consulting time and then one hour of her drive time? Because those would be the last two hours of her day. And that's not how it works out. So again, you're going to calculate a new regular rate, in this case, 1222, and then the overtime premium is half of that. So we would go back, since we've already paid her the $10 or the $15, now we're just saying, okay, we've got to pay the overtime premium for those extra five hours. So again, hopefully that makes sense. I think this is a common problem that comes up, and so I want to make sure that everybody understands exactly how, um, exactly how to uh, make those calculations. Okay, non-productive hours. This is another, you know, I say fairly new because not a lot of my clients have to deal with this, but um, it's actually from 2013. It just seems like it's new. Um, this was a court case having to do with auto mechanics. And basically what it used to be is you could say, okay, look, as long as over the course of the day with their piece rate work, and whatever, if we're paying the minimum wage or anything like that, but with their piece rate work, it at least equals minimum wage, everybody was happy, everything was good. And then what happened was they said, you know what, you can't do it that way. You can't go back and just take a look at how much they made piece rate. So I, you know, refurbish an engine, I do an oil change, whatever it is, and I get certain dollar amounts. Because they may have time off during the day where they're non-productive. They're sitting around, they're waiting for their next assignment. Now what, in this court case, what it said is, Nope, what you got to do is pay at least minimum wage during those non-productive hours. So it's not enough, again, to take a look at the total amount and then divide by the number of hours. Oh, we're over minimum wage, we're good to go. Can't do it that way. So if you've got people that get piece rate and that's how you're paying them, that's fine. But you have to make sure if there's downtime in between those assignments, that you're paying them at least minimum wage during those hours. So let's take a look at an example here. So let's say, um, okay, if I can get my slides to move, there we go. So on the left-hand side, whoops, on the left-hand side, we have um, an incorrect way of doing it. So this would have been the old way of doing it where a technician works 70 hours out of 80, so they have downtime of 10 hours, right? They're earning piece rate of $700, and then we would take a look and we go, okay, well, at nine bucks an hour, they have to make at least 720, so we're gonna go ahead and throw in an extra 20 to get them to that 720, okay? That used to be the way we could do it. Now what we have to do is we have to say, okay, during those 10 downtime hours, 
we have to pay them at least minimum wage. So in this example, they could be earning the same amount as piece rate, but now instead of being able to get away with paying them the 720, we have to add in the minimum wage for those downtime hours, and that takes us to $790. Okay, so hopefully everybody sees the difference there. Now, having said I don't like a couple of those rules, <laughs> I will tell you one of my favorite rules is makeup time, and I don't think enough employers take advantage of this. So, you know, California did away with this for a few years, and they brought it back, thankfully. Um, the reason I like this is this is a real-world practical situation that happens all the time. You have an employee that comes to you that says, you know what, can I leave two hours early for whatever reason? I have a doctor's appointment. I need to go pick up my kid at school. I've got something that I have to do, can I leave today two hours and make it up tomorrow instead by working 10? And for a while we had to say, nope, sorry, because we get stuck paying overtime. And I think a lot of employers do this just on a handshake outside the law. But this is actually a legal way that you can have your employees get what they need and you don't get stuck paying the overtime. So if an employee leaves two hours early on Tuesday and then wants to make it up on Thursday, Thursday, that's fine, as long as they fill out a form that says, hey, I'd like to do this as makeup time, you approve it, and you just keep it in their payroll file, because then if there's ever a question on why you didn't pay the overtime on that day, you say, oh, it's subject to makeup time, look, here's the form. Now, there's a couple of rules around that. One is it has to be in the same work week, not payroll period, same work week. So it's fine if I am sick Tuesday, and this can be done retroactively, so maybe I didn't plan on leaving early, so I didn't get it pre-approved, but I left early on Tuesday, I wasn't feeling well, and I come back the next day and I say, okay, can I make it up tomorrow? That's fine. Again, just put it in writing. It has to be in the same work week. I cannot be sick this Tuesday and make it up next Tuesday. I cannot exceed 11 hours in any day or 40 hours in the same work week. So if I leave half day on Tuesday, I cannot work 12 hours on Thursday to make it up. Okay, so it ha I cannot go over 11 hours in a day or 40 hours in a work week. And the employer may not encourage or solicit the employee. So it really this is supposed to be for the benefit of the employee. I think it's great because it's also for the employer benefit. Um, but that's what you need to do is fill out the form and make sure you have that. And if you need one of those forms, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to send you one. Okay, the next was on travel pay. And this comes up all the time. In fact, it came up just this week with one of my clients. Um, we did a whole webinar on this as well. So just make sure if you have any questions, just go to our YouTube channels. Both me and Marla have them set up. You can just Google either name out on YouTube, so to speak, and you'll find our channels. Mine's Ethos um, Human Capital Solutions or Ethos HCS. Um, on travel pay, you know, there's certain parts that you have to be aware of. And again, we're talking about mostly non-exempt, right? Because we're all, all non-exempt. Because if exempt people are traveling, it doesn't matter. They're getting paid a salary. So again, it, it doesn't come into to play. But for hourly people, the question is, okay, what, what do I have to compensate them for and what do I not have to compensate them for? The general rule is any time you have control over an employee, you have to compensate them. But the law is sort of funny on travel pay. It makes a difference if it's overnight versus all on the same day. So generally speaking, when you're traveling to and from the employer's place of business, that's not hours worked, right? So you don't have to pay someone to actually drive to work, thankfully, not yet anyway. Once they're at your work site and they're on the clock, so to speak, if it's related to the job, it's pay. So somebody, you say, hey, I want you to go over here to the store and pick something up, and they're traveling. Not only do you have to pay their time, but you're going to have to reimburse them for their mileage, right? Um, you need to go to this other site to work, right? So like Miriam, going back to my example with my senior HR consultant, Miriam doesn't come to my office, so that's a little bit different, but if she goes from one place to another place to another place, that's all time that she's spending you know, on my behalf. I, quote unquote, have control over her. Um, if you have them go someplace a substantial distance from their regular place of work, okay, it's compensable. Um, and what they do is they say, okay, take the amount of time that's their normal commute to work, subtract it out from, you know, the longer drive time, whatever it is. So, um, you know, Miriam's normal commute side, let's say she has to come to my office, which would be my house, um, and that's her normal commute time. If I have her go to San Diego, for the day, I could, in theory, technically subtract out, you know, the 10 miles or so from her house to my house and subtract that off from the longer commute. Okay, 
let's talk about um, out of town. So if somebody is going to travel out of town on your behalf, then basically all, tri all travel time counts as time worked. So you can deduct how long it takes them to get to you know, the airport or something like that. You can also deduct for normal meal periods, but pretty much um, you know, portable paid. So from the time they get to the airport, like I have a client, they just sent some people back to a trade show in New York. From the time they get to the airport to the time they arrive at their hotel in New York City, all of that is paid. So they could be reading a magazine on the plane, they can do whatever they want to, but portal portal, it's all paid because it's one day travel out of town. Um, once they get there, if they're free to do what they want to, they can go to see a show, they can go walk around, they can go shopping, they can go to dinner, they can go to a ball game, they can do whatever they want to do, then you don't have to pay for that time. But you do have to compensate them portal to portal. Um, overnight town out of travel, if um, this is sort of what I was just saying, if non-exempt employees are required uh, to go um, overnight out of town, you're paying for their travel time to and from the conference and seminar. Um, until they reach the destination. Okay, when it's unpaid, so if it's an exempt employee, like I said before, you're not paying them. If the employee voluntarily chooses to go someplace, um, you don't have to pay it. Again, if you're requiring them to go, you're going to pay it. Um, if they're shopping, sightseeing, sleeping, whatever, don't have to pay it. Um, and it's, at the end of the day, once you ride at the hotel, if they don't have any other work that you're requiring them to do, you no longer have control over what they do, you don't have to pay them. Okay, on rate of pay, just remember that um, you could, this is where you could have two different rates of pay. You're going to want to give them notice. You don't wait till the day they're supposed to go and go, oh, by the way, we're only going to pay you minimum wage when you're traveling. Um, I've, done, I've done the math on this a couple times where people could actually end up, you know, on a, with a short paycheck for actually doing what some people consider to be extra work, right, by traveling out of town. So you want to make sure you keep the morale part of this in check, but you could in theory, let's say somebody's going to travel out of town, they leave Sunday, they're going to be someplace for four or five days at a conference and come home the following weekend, and you're saying, wow, that's going to get really expensive if I'm paying them at their normal you know, hourly rate, let's say they get paid 25 or 30 bucks an hour. You could go to them and say, you know what, while you're on a plane, I only want to I only want to pay you as a travel time rate, you know, um, nine bucks an hour minimum wage. You could do that. Just make sure when you start adding all that up, you're not shortchanging the employee because that's going to become a morale issue pretty fast. Um, as long as you don't do it, so it's less than minimum wage and you're discriminatory, you're fine to have two different rates of pay. But remember the blended OT calculation that we just went through a few slides ago because they're going to have to, um, you're going to have to calculate that over time for them uh, once you start doing their payroll. Okay, um, let's see. All right, next we have uh, reporting pay. So again, we're talking about non-exempt employees. I'll let Marla talk about if it's exempt if she wants to, but for um, for non-exempt employees, if an employee reports to work on a scheduled work day, but they don't, you don't have work for them, or something else happens and you have to send them home, you are required by law to pay them half of the regular scheduled day's work up to four hours, okay, or two hours at her his regular rate of pay. Now, there's certain exceptions for this, but this may happen. You know, everybody gets to work and there's a power outage. Everybody gets to work and um, something happens, right? Uh, and you have to send them home. If it's something that's beyond the employer's control, like an act of God, for example, or public utility failure, like there's a power outage, then you can send them home and you don't owe them reporting pay. But if it's something like you just don't have enough work, product didn't come in, um, we can't make our parts today, something like that, then you are still required to pay them their reporting pay. All right, let's talk lastly, and then we're going to go to questions. Um, just a couple quick things before we get to the Q&A, so be thinking about your questions, and you can just type them into the box on the, your dashboard on the right-hand side, and then Julie will go through those and ask them with me and Marla. So this is another mistake I see a lot where people say, um, I don't want to, you know, I, I'm going to do mileage reimbursement, and they're going to be on an expense report. That's fine. Then you just expense it out, have it sent through accounts payable, or like with the case of my payroll company, they can tack it on an after-tax line item on the same check. That's all good. Um, but 
but there are some requirements that mean that mileage has to be taxed to the employee and others where they don't. And in the IRS code, they refer to it as accountable versus non-accountable plans. Now, I'm not a CPA, so again, seek guidance from your CPA, but here's the difference. If I'm making my employee be accountable by turning in their mileage and and saying how many miles miles that they traveled. So Miriam goes to San Diego, she tells me the client name, how many miles, all that sort of stuff, or the reason for it, then that's an accountable plan. She's accounting for her mileage. Then it's not taxed to her. But where I see this mistake made a lot is where, especially with executives, they go, oh yeah, that executive or that salesperson, we just have, you know, we pay a flat, you know, $500 a month auto allowance. Okay? They don't ever have to justify it. They don't have to give us mileage. They don't have to turn in receipts for anything. Okay? That's a non-accountable plan, and that is taxable income to the employee. And I see this mistake made over and over and over again. So make sure you take a look at how you're paying mileage to people. If you're not having them account for something, it has to be taxed to the employee. Okay? Um, and then also, again, we had a webinar on reimbursing mileage and some other expenses, so take a look at that as well. And finally, this is also a great time to tell you about our webinar next month, but there's um, the other thing to know, um, some just tricky payroll requirements that are coming up is remember that we have the new sick pay law that went into effect January 1st of this year. There's the new poster requirement that's been in effect since January 1st, and also the amended wage theft notice. Some people will call it a 2810.5 form because that's the part of the labor code. Um, however you talk about it, those are two reporting requirements that we have in place right now. Um, next month, and I think we have another slide on this, but next month um, we have a June webinar set up, and the June webinar actually um, will be talking more in depth about the sick pay requirements themselves. So we're finding out, you know, we're getting more clarifications get closer to July 1st, but there's still some really tricky situations. Most notably, you know, whether you're set up to actually track it if you're going to do accrual for your part-time people. Um, because I found out yesterday my payroll company actually can do that. They will track for every hour worked. Um, you know, they'll put in a, a small percentage, so by the time somebody works 30 hours, they get their one hour of sick pay if you're going to do it that way. Um, so just make sure that, that you're in on this June webinar because it's going to be really important uh, to be in compliance by July 1st. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Julie so Julie can uh, filter through some of those questions. And I think, Marla, you wanted to add something. Yes, I did. Marla? Thank you so much. Marla? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I wanted to add um, something on unauthorized deductions because this comes up a lot and I, I failed to see it on my notes. You cannot deduct for an employee's negligence. So if you have an employee who breaks a piece of company equipment or breaks a customer's um, item that the company ends up having to pay for, unless you can show that it was willful act or gross negligence, and those are two very, very high standards, um, such as stealing. In that case, you know, that, that, that's a, a definitely a willful act. Um, you cannot deduct for those things. Uh, it's part of the cost of doing business, according to the court, and you, you need to let it go and maybe discipline or terminate the employee. Okay, good. Great. Good. All right. Well, thanks, Linda and Marla. I feel like I got my PhD in payroll here. Just with some of these trickier ones, I was like, oh, I didn't know that. So thank you for helping us learn more about potential payroll mistakes that we might be making. Um, that does conclude the presentation portion of our webinar today, and we have about 10 minutes or so left to answer your questions. So as Linda mentioned, on the right-hand side, just click on that question box, and you'll be able to go in and uh, enter your question, and I'll read them aloud for Linda and Marla to answer. So let's start here first with Evelyn Hepburn. An exempt employee is being docked when they don't work 40 hours but we will not pay them overtime when they work, and the reason that was given was that they have a bona fide plan in place, hence the reason they deduct for hours not work. I don't know if I'm doing that correctly. Linda, are you seeing the questions as well? I'm not, and I didn't understand the question, to be honest with you. Okay. Let me read that. I'll I, mean, I, think, I, I think I did. I think, oh, Julie, I think I did. I'll just repeat it, and then you can tell me if I'm correct. They are deducting 
um, from an exempt employee, somebody that's classified as exempt, um, when that employee doesn't work 40 hours and they are not paying them overtime. But when that employee does work overtime, and, they, and because it's according to a plan, maybe a written plan between the employer and the employee, and that is incorrect. They should not be doing that. Ah. See, ah. you know what I said before, I think I understand. I think I understand. I think I understand. <laughs> So, okay, thank you. Thank you for that up. And I'm hearing some feedback, which is, I'm sorry. Um, here's Joanna. We have a question. As a benefit, we offer provide one day of jury duty for exempt employees. If the exempt employee no longer has PTO time available and is summoned for jury duty for 10 days, are we obligated to pay nine days of wages? Well, I'm going to let Marla answer the legal way, and I'm just going to tell you the practical way. How many exempt employees, or non-exempt for that matter, do you know, who aren't going to check messages, who aren't going to take phone calls, who aren't going to do a single minute of work on that day? It's just impractical. So like Marla said earlier, I don't want to speak for her, but when Marla said earlier she doesn't advise making those type of pay deductions, I have to agree with her because I just don't think there's any way you tell an exempt employee, hey, if you see something from a client or if your boss calls you or a coworker reaches out to you, don't even look at your phone. It's just not going to happen. They're going to do at least even a minute of work that day. It's going to be compensable time. Okay. Marla, did you want to Yeah, I'll weigh in. It's actually on the slide, but Linda's, Linda's correct um, from a practical standpoint, absolutely. I, it, it would, I would be shocked if someone didn't check their emails that night when they got home from jury duty, because jury duty ends at 5 o'clock, sometimes 4.30, and a lot of times it's there come Friday. But the rule is, if it's a full work week, then you don't have to pay for that full work week. But if, if they, again, if they work any part of that, and remember, you have to define what the work week is. Okay. All right, good. Thank you. And Marla, this one's for you. Um, you mentioned a law about deducting debt from payroll. What was the name of that law again? Barnhill. It's a yeah. Okay. It's a case. It's if you just type in the Barnhill case, type in Barnhill and employee wage deduction, and the case will come up. And it's I don't know, thirty years old now. Okay. Forty. Got it. In. Um, Susanna had a question here. Can pay be deducted from a salaried employee for suspension due to violation of company policy? Yes. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. Marla? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to weigh in here because some employees are paid on a salary, but they're not exempt. Um, so, for example, in our law firm, the legal secretaries, because it's more professional sounding to get a, sal a salary. But if they work overtime, we have to pay them overtime because they're not exempt. Um, but if if they were to be suspended for violating company policy, yes, absolutely, we, we you can withhold their pay. You can't make a deduction, you can just withhold their pay. Um, if the person's exempt, no, the answer is no, you cannot if they worked some part of that work week. Yeah, and I think the reason it came up is because on our slide it's under impermissible. And I think this is one where it, there's a dispute in the law, and so we're taking the conservative approach and saying it's impermissible because there's been, um, I don't remember if it, like which way federal goes, but California I, I think says you're not supposed to do it if they're exempt. And that's why we have it on that slide. So the person asked the question, you didn't misread it. Um, I'm still going to say I think you go for it, but that's why we put it on the impermissible slide. Okay, good. And Patty had a question. We have an employee on salary. She's a developmental director. She is not an executive, administrative, professional, or outside salesperson. Wouldn't she be hourly and not exempt? I'll take well, this one. We don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. We need to go through the analysis of whether she falls into any of the exemptions. So if you want to email either Linda or me, um, more of her job description, we could go through the analysis and tell you whether she's exempt or non-exempt. So and maybe this question came up before the last one in which I said, even non-exempt employees can be paid a salary, but if they work overtime, you've got to convert the salary to hourly and then pay them overtime. So it's not recommended. If they're not exempt, you should pay them hourly, just because people get confused. Okay, good. Linda, did you want to weigh in on that or are you okay? 
Yeah, it's fine. I mean, you have to take a look at where they're spending their time. Because I think the biggest mistake I see with my clients, they say, oh, well, I'll just call them, you know, payroll manager, but it's a payroll person that's processing payroll. You know, it's, it doesn't matter what you call them. It doesn't matter title. It doesn't matter anything like that. It matters where they're spending their time and then what those duties are. Good. And Crystal has a question. What is the difference between deducting a deduction of pay and withholding pay? You should never withhold pay. <laughs> okay. You should never yeah, ever like, withhold pay. Deducting is when it's permissible. You should never okay. withhold pay. And by the way, when you make a mistake, if you deduct for something you're not allowed to deduct for, so an example I gave earlier, um, they didn't return their cell phone, so I'm going to deduct, uh, you know, $500 for the cost of the cell phone. If that was improper because you did not have a receipt of company property property form or signed authorization from the employee to allow for that, you have improperly withheld wages, which means you are now subject to the waiting time penalties, which can be up to 30 days. So if it's been more than 30 days by the time that employee gets to the DLSE and files their claim for that wage, you are going to owe a whole month's worth of wages as a penalty. Okay. Um, one quick question yet, um, just as a follow-on. Can we deduct for wages overpaid from prior pay periods on, on the final pay? Not unless you want to get, get sued or <laughs> want to pay. <laughs> Again, go through the same. Okay. One, one final, final question. Okay. Um, it looks to me like we are wrapping it up here. Um, that is all the time we have for questions. I really want to thank Linda Duffy with Ethos Tuesday Capital Solutions and Marla Mara Robinson with Mara Robinson, Jackson and Clarkson for really working with us today on how to handle those tricky payroll situations. Um, again, Linda and Marla's contact information are is right here on the screen, but it's also they're along with their bios embedded in there. So feel free to email them with other questions on this. I know we can't cover everything in this hour's worth of time, but feel free to contact them with any questions. And then, of course, Linda mentioned that we are going to be doing the sick paid leave webinar on June 18th at 11 a.m. So the registration link there is right there. So please sign up for that as well. Ladies, did you have anything you want to add? Nope. Thanks, Julie. That was great. Good. All right. Thank well, you very we much. appreciate your time. Thanks, Carla. We appreciate your time, and I'm so glad your voice held up. Um, and have a great yeah. rest of the day.